But there, I was whole and complete. And it was wonderful. I think that's why so many people describe it as being home, because you've come home to yourself. I've never been happier in my life. And I was filled with joy. I was like a kid at Christmas. I wanted to run to the top of the hill. I needed to get to that tree because I knew if I got there, I'd never come back here. Hello, passionate listeners and watchers. Welcome to Passion Harvest. I am Louisa, your host. Thank you so much for joining me wherever you are in the world right now. I am so excited about our guest today, Reverend David McGinley. Reverend David McGinley survived cancer four times, which resulted in a profound near-death experience, an NDE. Reverend David is an ordained minister, and his NDE allowed him to explore consciousness and the connection of body, mind, and spirit from both sides of the veil. He is the author of Beyond Surviving Cancer and your spiritual journey. This is his story and this is his passion, Reverend David McGinley. So honored to have you on the show today. Welcome to Passion Harvest. Thanks so much for having me. I always am uh, privileged to, to share this sort of um, journey because it helps people find hope in the darkest times. It's a, it's a great adventure that we're on with life and I think the greatest surprise is that it ends more than well, right? It ends with a transformation, which um, is such a, an ultimate reassurance in the face of uh, what's going on in the world today with the pandemic and other things. So yeah. happy to help build hope in, in people's hearts. Well, I'm, I'm so excited to share your experiences yeah. today. So Reverend David McGinley, if you don't mind, I'd like to get started. With you. You've survived cancer four times. Do you mind sharing a few pieces with that about that with the audience? Yeah, I'm a really lucky man. I have a, a history with a rare type of cancer called paranganglioma. So unlike other cancers that spread out through your body and compromise your body's systems, Mine sits like a time bomb, a Molotov cocktail, and it produces dopamine, norepinephrine, catecholamines, and these metabolites um, are deadly when in their uh, high concentrated forms. When my adrenal gland would kick in for any reason, right? I could get excited, uh, I could get angry, I could be exercising, anything that triggers the adrenal gland, that would be a switch and it would cause the tumor to blow. Now I've survived many small explosions, uh, but it causes your blood pressure to skyrocket and your blood vessels to burst. And most people are dead in about a minute during my internship. So as a Lutheran minister, mm -hmm. uh, Lutheran is very much like Anglican, Episcopalian, Catholic. Um, I was on internship. So I was a student minister and I was doing sermons every Sunday. But public speaking is one of the most anxiety provoking things you can do. <laughs> Every time I got into the pulpit, I was taking my life in my hands. Many times I actually passed out uh, from, from the tumor. Now, uh, I put a lot of people to sleep on Sunday morning, but it's not good when the minister becomes unconscious. <laughs> <You're funny. laughs> I, um, I, I thought that I was simply a nervous wreck. Maybe I didn't have what it took to, to follow this, this vocation. But I, uh, I, I was so relieved when I found out it wasn't me, it was the tumor doing that. Anyway, I had another one at 35 years of age and another one at 38. But this second one, when I was 27, uh, when it blew, um, I, I was doing a hospital chapel service. So there were patients and doctors and nurses there and I passed out. And uh, of course it scared everyone. They got all the patients out of the room and the doctor and the nurse, they did CPR on me and they tried to revive me. And I was dead for 15 minutes. I had no heart, heartbeat or anything. Wow. Now 30 seconds of oxygen starvation to the brain can result in permanent damage. And while I would love to use that for, as an excuse for my poor memory, uh, actually, I didn't suffer any brain damage from that, that period, but I did have a near-death experience. And that was wonderful, 
Wonderful. So a lot of people, one in 10 who have a brush with death will have a near death experience or an out of body experience. It's really common, but people don't talk about it because they don't realize it's common and that, um, that probably they know somebody who's had one. I was training to be a minister. So you'd think that I would know about them, but I didn't. And the church doesn't, right? The church really is quite uninformed about this ultimate hope that we actually proclaim every Sunday, but don't dare to imagine that a lot of people in the, in the pew, right? In the congregation might have had one. So I, uh, I passed out. I was gone before I hit the floor. And I found myself suddenly on a grassy hill. And it sounds so simple when I describe it. There was a tree at the top of the hill, this singular tree. Uh, and I could feel every blade of grass as it moved. Um, I could feel the tree drinking in the light and the light was flowing through me and the light was love itself. But not love as an emotion, I've come to understand how can I describe it? Love, if God is love, then love is the highest state of consciousness. Uh, completely integrated, completely congruent, completely authentic, connected. Um, such a contrast to what we experience here. Like your audience is, you're listening to me, you're thinking about words I just said, or you're wondering where this is gonna go, and part of you may be hungry, or thinking about other things that you need to do today. We're rarely, if ever, fully present in the moment and congruent. There's so much of myself that is suppressed in my subconscious. But there, I was whole and complete, and it was wonderful. I think that's why so many people describe it as being home, because you've come home to yourself. I've never been happier in my life. And I was filled with joy. I was like a kid at Christmas. I wanted to run to the top of the hill. I needed to get to that tree because I knew if I got there, I'd never come back here, right? And I knew I was somewhere else or something else. And it was much better than this. Now, the, the amazing thing is I wasn't alone as if that all wasn't amazing enough. There, there was an entity there, and um, it was a masculine figure, a character filled with so much power and strength and wisdom and compassion and love and understanding and a great sense of humor. And he felt like my best friend. And uh, I just said to him, come on, come on, let's run. Let's get, get to the top of the hill. And he said, uh, it's great to see you, David. It's great that you're here, but..." You, we need to talk. And so we, we walked in the grass and we talked and um, I kept sort of giddy saying, I'm home, I'm home. And he said, yeah, it's, and you're so loved and it's, it's going very well. Your life is going very well. Uh, but um, we need to talk. You're doing a good job. Things are going as planned. That's an interesting thing, thing to hear but you have a lot more work to do. And uh, my response to that was, I don't care. I'm here, I'm home, come on, let's get to that tree. I was trying to will my feet to run. Um, they, they seemed, I don't know, I don't know how to describe it. It was the power of his presence. It was this authority and strength. I, I just couldn't move like, I was transfixed by that love and it was pouring from his heart. And we talked about my life. Uh, I don't remember the, the details of that, but I remember this great assurance that things were going well. He said, you have a lot more work to do. Uh, and um, don't worry, we, plural, we will be with you, uh, but you have to go back. I. I know that I know that the songs and the stories say there's there's only joy in heaven, but my heart sank at the realization that I wasn't going to win this argument, that I couldn't stay, and I just pleaded, please don't send me back. 
I don't, why would I go back? This is what my heart has been aching for. And he said, it's important work. You have to go back. We will be with you. And don't worry. He put his hand on my shoulder and he said, we'll see you later. And then boom, I, I was back. I, coming back is the worst part of a near-death experience. The, the weight of the body, the pull of gravity, the density of flesh. I, I, I keep, when I just tell the story, I keep talking about the poverty of words. Uh, my words are completely inadequate to describe what I experienced and the way that they have to go one after the other and your thoughts have to flow one after the other. It all takes so much time. There I was communicating consciousness to consciousness, but here I have to bumble up through these words and vocabulary and try to impart my heart to you. Um, it's very awkward and clumsy. And they, anyway, they, I heard their voices, the doctor and the nurse, David, are, can you hear us? And, I opened my eyes and uh, immediately the entire experience just sort of descended into my subconscious because I, I wasn't able to hold it. It was too vast. I couldn't integrate it. And when you come back, you really have to deal with the reality you're embedded in. So I had to deal with the sensory experience now again of taste and texture and sight and hearing all separate senses, not integrated like they were there. And um, my first thought went to the patients, right? I said, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry I passed out. I'm sorry I scared everyone, right? I'm sorry I'm being an inconvenience. Notice how the ego just takes over right away. They, um, they took my vitals. They checked my head for a concussion. They, they couldn't find anything wrong. They didn't know about the tumor. And near, I didn't die there until I got back after my internship. Um, they, they wrapped me in a blanket. And uh, then, then I went home and I crawled into bed and I grieved. I just felt sad to be here. And it's, it's difficult sharing it, right? You can hear it in my voice because the, the experience lives in you. It never fades. I've been homesick for 30 years. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, you, you'd think I'd get up in the pulpit and preach it the next Sunday, right? <laughs> I, I didn't tell anyone. Um, I didn't know what to do with it. And I didn't... I suppressed it. You know, most adults take about 10 years to integrate the entire experience. And that was true for me too. But it sent me down a path that led to my life now, which I wouldn't trade for a moment. And I'm so glad I'm here and I'm doing, I'm pretty confident. I'm doing the work they sent me back to do. I'm now a hospital chaplain, interfaith. I see everybody facing cancer on the palliative floor and in the intensive care. And I help them negotiate with mortality. I help them find the best of themselves in the worst moments. And I help them um, work with the unfinished love stories of their lives and uh, try to help them be embedded in the moment they're fighting for, right? And use cancer, don't, not only to go through cancer, but to, to grow through cancer, to, use a medical crisis to deepen your humanity and amplify your love and focus your, your heart and feel this beautiful life that is so significant. That's what happened. Oh my gosh, that was, I know it's very hard to describe in words, but you described it so beautifully and articulately. Thank you so much, David. Um, how have you, Obviously, you detailed a little bit, but how have you changed fundamentally since your near-death experience, your explorations and consciousness after that, and perhaps many years preceding that? I was uh, such an introvert and so anxious and nervous about life and living and wouldn't put myself out there, right? Which prevented me from finding the better part of myself. But cancer 
and then this near-death experience. Help me step up to whatever gifts are lying within me and step out into suffering and, and sorrow and um, manifest or incarnate a hope and a, a light and a compassion and, and, and to do things I never imagined I would do. Uh, not, not dangerous, ridiculous, adventurous <laughs> things. I, I really should try harder on that department. <laughs> but to find my, my vocabulary, my hope, my, my voice, and to trust it, and to step into situations that scare me. And now I do that every day, every patient I see, right? And um, I'm, I'm so grateful for that. In terms of my faith, wow. <laughs> as a, as clergy, right? It blew the doors off of uh, what I understood about Jesus, about the Bible, about spirit, about the afterlife, about God. All of the doctrines, right? All of the um, understandings and teachings have just blossomed. They have new life, new energy. Um, now I, I, like I, I look to the Bible and I, if I'm reading that, it's got, it's got so much more in there than I ever realized. Uh, it's expanded my theology and my doctrine way beyond, I, I have to say way beyond orthodoxy, but it's grounded in science, in research. There's a lot of research on this phenomenon and a lot of research, exciting stuff on the nature of consciousness which I think is the heart of spirituality. The question ultimately is not, is there a God? The question is, what is consciousness? And the evidence, the best theories show or indicate that we live in a reality that emanates from and is sustained by a realm of pure consciousness. So I like to say your consciousness is the only real estate you share with God. Invest wisely. <laughs> That's great. I love that. It's really great. Yeah. So, so in, do, do, do we create our reality? Everything comes from within, th through our consciousness, our perceptions. We create the reality around us. I'm suspecting that we have the power to do that on one level. For example, the, um, uh, there, there's an experiment in which a photon of light is sent through a, a, a hole or a split or a, right it's called the collapse of the wave function mm -hmm. and uh, then it's the the light hits uh, a black board at the, the end and you'd think you would see a point of light or a line of light but it causes an interference pattern uh, and that interference pattern behaves differently if it's being if it's being observed or measured compared to if it's not which indicates that the observer has an effect upon the manifestation of the photons of light. And other experiments have shown that the, this is indeed the case, and you can manifest a fairly complex particle uh, by the act of your observation. So we're creating reality on a subatomic level. We're certainly interfacing with it. Consciousness has an important part to play. Now, does that mean I have the power to manifest my coffee cup? Or even better, a good cup of coffee? <laughs> uh, no, I don't. However, uh, and it's because the more complex the interference pattern, uh, the more complex the uh, interaction of consciousness. But the coffee cup doesn't appear there simply because I look at it, but because of collective consciousness. Those who have seen a cup before and will in the future, and all who are present in the, in the world. I think that all of our consciousness coalesces to manifest this world. We still have great power as individuals, though. I'm, I'm confident of that. But to manifest that power, we have to get out of our own way. You have to put the ego aside. Um, and I think come in partnership with the spirit. Um, there's an old, old saying, I love this. Uh, it's a, uh, God cannot meet you unless you are not there. So getting out of your own way, 
brings you into partnership with the field of consciousness. And I think that you can do remarkable things in that relationship. This is one of the ultimate mysteries, right? That we're trying to unravel. And it's, I think, more complicated than we could ever imagine. Yes, it's infinite possibilities or probabilities. Um, you've detailed a little bit, but how do you integrate your deep research consciousness and your experiences with the Christian faith? Yeah, uh, a lot of people, the Christian church generally, um, has um, emphasized what's called an atonement theology in which uh, Jesus dies as a, um, a substitute for ourselves, dies for our sins. It's a sacrificial yeah. atonement. But it's embedded in an ancient concept of a judgmental God and um, uh, a framework of righteousness and holiness that is demanded by God, yet we cannot attain. This is not the only model of the crucifixion and of, of the life of Christ. There are many models one of which uh, uses that word atonement, but brings it back to what it meant, at one meant, right? Uh, and so you, one can look at the crucifixion as an act of ultimate compassion in which uh, this man does not turn away from suffering or the, um, the darkness to come upon him, but enters into it with a clarity of heart and love that enables him even to forgive those who are persecuting him. And that's a model for what we can do in partnership with the divine. It shows up in other religions. In the Buddhist tradition, there's a practice called uh, Tonglen, in which you're meditating upon and you focus upon your distress and your darkness or your pain or whatever. I use this with patients. And then instead of trying to fix it, you, brought, you breathe in more of it from other people. So I'll be with a patient, I'll say, you're, you're in pain right now, breathe in more pain from the patients around you, add it to yours, and then breathe back your compassion with the words, I understand, I'm with you. Now, one can think of the crucifixion in that way. Uh, in the Buddhist tradition, this is to become a bodhisattva, a warrior of compassion. And um, it changes your relationship to suffering, suffering, and it uses suffering as fuel for more love. Wow, that's a great model. It's wonderful. That's, that's, yeah. So that and some other aspects like prayer in the church continues to be petitioning to an external God instead of participating in the consciousness of God. And yet Jesus emphasized, especially in his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, may they be one with us just as I am one with you. You and me, us in them, them in us, right? And there's a little letter at the end of the Bible by, uh, by John, it's, it's first John in the second, um, second chapter, it says, those who love know God and God lives in them. And those who do not love do not know God. So really your spirituality is determined by the quality of your love. It's not determined really by the content of your belief. Oh my goodness. That, that, that's a different perspective. Now, your belief should have some integrity. Now, I'm not saying it can be a, anything out there, right? Uh, it's got to have some integrity. But even if you've got a rock solid belief system uh, with great doctrine and ideas, as I imagine I do at times, it's going to fall far short of the mystery that's waiting on the other side. The poverty of our words simply cannot translate the wonder that awaits. Yeah. Focus on your love. Let, let that be your spiritual practice. It's all about love. And also what I'm hearing is that God is within us. He's not an external for right. some far off universe. He's right here right now. And you are then intrinsically perfect. You are absolutely wondrous. You are a one of a kind expression of the universal consciousness from which reality emanates. You are just this gift. Wow. Now that takes a load off. No need to measure up. You can be kind and compassionate with the ego and the monkey mind. You can be uh, have a sense of humor about your inconsistent behavior. 
and your upsets. You can be a little more kind to yourself. And together we will bumble towards transformation. Um, gosh, I've got a lot of questions for you, but I'll try and reduce it. What are your tips for reducing that ego or that monkey mind, as you call it? Well, I'm still working on that one. <laughs> mine is ridiculous. Right. Mine too sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Um, I like what Brene Brown says. Uh, she talks about the various critical voices inside and all the the you know, we have a thought every three to five seconds. So let the mind do that. Don't try to stop it and calm it down. You're only going to stir things up by doing that. Let it do whatever it wants. Well, Brene Brown says, you say, it's okay, kids, you stay in the back seat because mama's driving. <laughs> I love that. Right. That's uh, you're not going to find your mind calm and absolutely peaceful by trying to quiet the kids down. You already got your hands on the wheel. By observing them, stepping back and observing them, they will calm down. Uh, Rupert's Spira, fantastic um, teacher, uh, meditation teacher. I love his example. He has something called direct experience. And he, uh, he says, take a moment now and just listen to the sounds in your environment. Notice how they're passing by. They're not permanent. Now listen to your thoughts. Just step back and watch your thoughts. Let them move. Notice how they're not essential to who and what you are. Okay. Now step back and watch your feelings. Notice any feelings that arise as you do this. Now step back and watch your experience of being in a body, of being behind these eyes, of perceiving. Watch, watch your experience. Now step back. To what? Hmm. Beautiful. Um. Yeah. Really, really. Oh, I'm so calm and relaxed after that. <laughs> um, you mentioned the prayer before, and I just briefly like to talk about the power of prayer. Often many people ask, well, how, not only the power, which I think is incredible, but how do I pray? Yeah, uh, when your prayer is just from the mind, uh, it doesn't have anywhere near the energy as when it's from the heart. Uh, and when your heart and mind are synchronized with, with the prayer, it's going to have a, a greater energy. The Institute of Heart Math uh, did a great research project on this uh, using a super quantum interference magnetometer, which can measure biofields, very expensive device. And they found when you're in a state of what they call coherence, you're manifesting and focusing upon compassionate intention. Your heart and your brain come into an electrical rhythm that's harmonious and actually follows the golden mean ratio. And when you hit that golden point, the field from the heart leaps out. It's the strongest in the body and it can be measured up to like 12 feet away. However, its effects can be measured much further than that. Um, so when we pray, uh, to do it with your whole being from your deepest truth, to feel it, which isn't putting a lot of effort into it, right? It's really getting your ego out of the way. Try to be in the moment and listen to what your heart desires, right? I, I had a wonderful conversation with a, a woman who had a near-death experience because of a reaction to chemotherapy medication. And she found herself by a, a flowing river with a guide and there were these beams and columns of light coming up out of the ground and out of the water and she asked her guide what are those and uh, the angelic form said oh oh she, she mentioned some of those beams of light were rather gray and amorphous and others were like rainbow spectrum columns and he said those are the prayers of people and those that don't have a lot of emotional intention or a lot of commitment, they just dissipate. They're gray and they, they have no integrity, right? And the energy is low. But 
the brightest ones, he said, those are the prayers of mothers for their children. Mm -hmm. Wow. So when we're praying, even though she said these beams were coming up into what we might call heaven, I would encourage you uh, not to lift the prayer up, but to just to grow that light within, because that's where the divine is. It's not outside of you. And participate, commune with that presence, even if you can't articulate what it is or imagine it, right? And you really just focus that prayer as a light of, um, right, of hope. Um, I would also encourage anyone to pray from a place of gratitude and abundance. Uh, I know a lot of prayers are said from scarcity and fear, and I understand why, because I do that too, because I'm overwhelmed and I want some help. But breathe, use the STOP acronym, which means slow down, take a breath, observe yourself, then proceed or pray. Um, an anxious mind is a scattered consciousness. Try to use your breath, still down. Maybe use that little meditation from Rupert Spira. Step back, step back from your fear, right? And try not to think of your fear as something bad that's gonna swallow you. Your fear is fuel. It helps you focus uh, clearly on what is critical, what is at risk. I can activate your consciousness even more. Thank you. That was just explained so well. I'm feeling it in my heart right now. Um, mm -hmm. I just wanted to ask you, have you had any more conversations with Jesus since your near-death experience? Oh, they're all one way. I wish the guy would <laughs> drop me a line. Yeah. I remember during one of my subsequent operations, after my last uh, cancer, I remember praying as I was being put uh, to sleep, please let me die for just a little, little oh. while. Let me, let me have visit, please. And when I woke up, I had nothing. And I, I knew it right away. And I just, and I'm in the recovery unit. And, and I said, why not? Come on. I got nothing, no response back. That's because I was doing that from my ego, from my need. Mm. but spirit has guided me in the most sublime ways more times than I can count at the hospital, going in a conversation with a patient, the perfect timing, the perfect words, um, or flowed through me as I'm doing, um, I do therapeutic touch with patients and we use this in the hospital. I'm moving my hands over their body through the energy field. I'm being a conduit for for love to flow through and help facilitate their body to find balance. So many times I felt the presence of a celestial assistant, uh, which I'm very grateful for. And there was one case where the patient was allergic to all the drugs we would normally give them to offset the effect of chemotherapy, which induces nausea and vomiting. And, and uh, it's really important that they would have caused him to go into anaphylactic shock. So the doctor said, David, go do that weird thing you do <laughs> on this patient. And I tried to explain it. And she said, I'm not the patient, just go do your job. So I went in and I explained it. I gave therapeutic touch and I'm moving through the energy field. He had no antiemetics, no drugs to offset the chemo. And he had no reaction uh, other than peace, equanimity. And at the end of it, he just opened his eyes and he said, man, that felt like a massage of light. Oh, that's so beautiful. Wow. And the power now, I know of what, love and intention is so strong. It's so strong. Now, I know I'm not that good. So <laughs> you I don't take the credit. Never, never, don't take the credit. <laughs> as soon as you do that, you're going to mess it up. Right. I'm so grateful for their assistance. Yeah, it's wonderful. Well, I love your gratitude, but I also think you're amazing. Just a few questions, and I'm sure you get asked these all the time. Why are we here? Mm. Wow. Okay. Let me, let me run this by you. To, 
Tell me what you think. Oh, you're the Some interviewer now. Period. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Yeah. In the Christian tradition, in the Buddhist tradition, uh, in some other traditions, God is explained in three forms, right? whether that's Krishna, Shiva, and Vishnu, or Father, Son, Holy Spirit, or whatever. And the, this Trinitarian model is an expression not of um, what is God, literally three persons. It's a, it's, it's a model of relationship. So it's not enough for the divine consciousness just to be. The very nature of that would manifest in a creative force. So to do that, the divine consciousness must separate self from self in order to reflect back upon self, right? Must create something. And when we create something, we impart it, and now it's external to us. And as soon as there's two, then there is a third because there's a relationship. There's another force going between them. So as the father conceives, the spirit creates and the son or the universe experiences. We are the experience of God. Repeated manifestations of separation induce amnesia as we, um, for matter is the densest form of spirit, right? So it's not a dualistic thing, it's a, it's a continuum. And as you get more and more dense, you're more further, further away from the source. Now we're down here in the physical form, no less sacred, it's the densest form, but in order, well, with the human condition, our amnesia has really gone deep and so we supplant divine consciousness with our own uh, illusion of consciousness or, or experiment of consciousness. So why are we here? Uh, because we're part of the mosaic expression of the creative force. But what are we here for? To remember, I like what Rumi says, we're all walking each other home. We are here to help each other wake up to the reality that we never were separate from God, that all of creation is this song of life. The question then isn't, are you playing the song? The question is, are you in tune? Mm. So when you love each other, you become in tune with the divine resonance and the vibration of, of creation. Well, it's all about love. And then since we are all interconnected, when we when all of us learn and grow and have experiences, suffering, joy, hope, we are all learning as a collective consciousness. Is that correct? Right. So as I grow, I'm actually helping you grow because all consciousness is connected. Right. And look uh, how wonderful this is, the ripple out effects from our conversation, how many people will learn and grow from this as well, and inadvertently their families or the communities. It's it's just wonderful. Right. We want to reach that critical point where you get into what's called, Rupert Sheldrake calls it morphic resonance, right? Where the heartfelt resonance of consciousness, as well as this knowledge, spontaneously spills out in the species. Uh, that's what uh, we're here to do. That's what a, a light bringer will do. Our job is to shine. That's what we're here for. Oh, I love that. Um, just two final questions, if you don't mind. You can't. You have answered this, but just to clarify it for the audience, many people, I'm sure, ask you this as well. Why suffering? Because we're really good at messing it up. <laughs> uh, I, I know that I was told that there's a plan, right? But that doesn't mean a plan like we understand it. I actually believe it's critical to move beyond the phrase, there's a reason for everything. Uh, that too often is a way to abdicate our role as partners with the divine in healing the world. It is a, a way to put handles on the chaos and to give a little hope in the midst of suffering. I hear my patients say it all the time. I understand the power of those words. 
So I actually, I have no idea what, why suffering. Uh, I, I can consider it's part of the evolutionary path of all living creatures. But suffering is our relationship to an event. Uh, pain is of the body. Suffering is of the soul and of the mind. So it really is spiritual homework to engage with suffering in a new way as fuel for healing and transformation. If any reason is there, it must be um, the call to all of us to step up where we are as we can and make a difference. That way, God doesn't cause suffering, but it, the divine can use suffering to help awaken humanity. That's an important nuance. Mm -hmm. um, beyond that, I think it gets more complicated than I can understand. So I'm just going to shine where I am and do what I can. Well, you keep shining your incredible light. Um, final question. Many people are afraid of death and dying. What would you advise those that are listening or watching? Yeah, um, I understand that. It is the ultimate event. It is the ultimate terrifying uh, th thing to imagine. My experience of dying was, dare I say, easy, because it was sudden. But I sit with those who suffer into death, sometimes for months. And it, I, I appreciate it. it can be excruciating. When you see death coming, plan for it. Um, talk to your family about your beliefs about death. Explore websites like yours, right? Interviews like these. Uh, there's a document called an advanced care plan. In Canada, we go to advancedcareplanning.ca and wonderful resources there. Realize though that the final event of death is the safest thing you could ever go through because it's not... Um, who, I think Elizabeth Barrett Browning said, death is not, uh, death is a comma, not a period, right? Death is a transformation. And if you're able to be present with a loved one who's dying, you may witness their shift into transpersonal states of consciousness, uh, their comprehending spiritual entities. You may even get caught up in it. Uh, it's called a shared death experience. Once you touch upon that realm, you realize there's nothing to fear. Now, uh, that's, a, that's about death itself. Dying, well, we worry about pain. And um, if you're experiencing some of that, don't be shy about the drugs. Medication is there to help keep you comfortable, but you balance consciousness against that in conversation with your family and loved ones. Oh, we could, we could have an entire conversation about <laughs> this. Um, you, you, you yeah. Talk, talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, about where's the best place for people to contact you, Reverend David McGinley? Uh, I'll just go to davidmcginley.com um, or you could Google me. Uh, from my website, you can send me an email. That's, that's really easy. Mm -hmm. Reverend David McGinley, thank you so much for being on Passion Harvest. I'm so inspired. I'm so calm after our conversation and what a light you are in the world. And I, I know you're homesick, but I'm glad you came back <laughs> to share the yeah. incredible love that you have. I'm glad now too. I needed to grow into love a lot more. I, I just was not ready over there. Uh, it was good for a visit, but I don't think I was the type of entity that could remain and resonate at that frequency. I had a lot more growing to do. So um, that's what I'm doing. And I, I wish your viewers all the, all the best in that enterprise as well. Just keep shining because the world needs your light. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much for being on Passion Harvest. Bye-bye. My pleasure. Bye-bye. If you liked this episode, please do subscribe for weekly passionate inspirational interviews.